But if you want the full experience of the Godhead, if you want the full experience of God, it's in the gathered body. It's not in you personally and individually. To the Lord. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. Okay, <laughs> Brother John D is a great inspiration to all of us. He just whispered to make it short, so I won't go too far. But I can't hardly uh, overestimate how much an influence I think Brother John D's had on almost everyone in this room, if not all of us, many times over. And I just want to pray that the Lord would give you grace. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this dear brother and how he's, he's been so much uh, a blessing to all of us here in this room. And I just pray that you would give him an anointing tonight Amen. and just lift up the simple words of Jesus Christ, Amen. the simple words of the Scripture, and that you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would fulfill your promise to accomplish the Word and what it means when you bring out the Word, Lord. So I just Amen. pray, make him a a messenger of you, and anoint him, and help all of us to hear what you have to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his might and sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, a deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Redeemer, Redeemer, and Friend. Well, God bless you. This has been a really refreshing time for me tonight, especially t t through this uh, weekend. Especially tonight. This is the first time I've been able to sing for about two weeks. <laughs> and I was tempted to do it so lustily, lustfully that, uh, lustily that uh, you would, uh, and I wouldn't have a voice to preach yet tonight. But you know, someday the preaching will all be over. Someday the praying will all be over. Everything will be over. The only thing we're going to do there that we do here is praise God, mostly in song. Amen. And so that's tremendous. In fact, if you look on the front of your hymn book, it says, Come Before His Presence with Singing. That's taken from Psalm 100. You know, in the days of the kings, you did not come into the presence of a king without the best gift you could bring. You didn't go barging into his presence to make your request. And I'm afraid too many times we do that. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands, but it'd be interesting to know how many of you sing before you have any other part of your devotional in the morning. Uh, I have been doing that now for years because the Bible says the gift that God prescribes to come into his presence is singing. And uh, that he's looking for us to bring that gift, a, a gift of praise before we do anything else in his presence. So, Ray Palmer, uh, I wasn't aware till I came here so how many things have happened in this city <laughs> that I know. Uh, I forgot the fact that uh, uh, Lowell Mason lived in this city and actually established the Academy, uh, Boston Academy of Music and he met Ray Palmer on the street one day here in Boston. Ray Palmer was a man who was worked to death. 
He was trying to go to school. He was teaching in a ladies' seminary. He was working to, to earn his uh, uh, tuition to go through school, and he was totally exhausted. And he took out his little Morocco notebook one night and wrote in it this, this poem. Never expected anybody else to see it. But Ray Palmer met him on the streets here somewhere and said, uh, I'm compiling a new hymnal. Would you happen to have something to contribute? And so he pulled out his little notebook and showed Ray Palmer this song. And Ray Palmer said this. He said, Miss, uh, I'm sorry, Lowell Mason said this. Mr. Palmer, you may live long, a long life and you may do many things, but I do not believe you will do anything that will be as significant as this song. Wow. He went on to be an outstanding preacher. You probably have never heard of him, but we sing his song. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you tonight for people like Ray Palmer, people like Lowell Mason, who enshrined in these wonderful texts, these wonderful tunes, the glory of your majesty and our entire theology. Lord, help us to choose wisely the songs we sing and to sing truly what you want us to believe. Bless us tonight as we open your word. Help us to understand a little more of your will for our lives and help us, Lord, to live more faithfully a Christ-like expression in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Another thing about singing, singing is the only activity that we have that brings together our will, our mind, and our emotions all in one expression. And that's why I think one of the reasons, many, one of the many reasons I could talk a long time on music, why it is so powerful. I want to talk a little bit about the Amazon River as an introduction. <clears throat> the Amazon River is the largest river in the world. It's not the longest, the Nile is the longest, but it is by far the largest in terms of the quantity of water <clears throat> that goes out the mouth of that river. The mouth is 90 miles wide. And the flow of that river exceeds the entire <clears throat> total of the Yangtze, the Mississippi, and the Nile. All those put together. There's more water comes out of the Amazon River than all of the, those three rivers put together. In fact, the, <clears throat> the flow of water is so large <clears throat> and so strong that for 200 miles out from the mouth, the water is fresh. And that's interesting because boats would come into that area, and that area is known to have times when there is no wind. And so these sailing vessels would come into this area and uh, they would sit there long enough to run out of water and many people died of thirst right in those waters. And once in a while, when they, there'd be a ship there that uh, had exhausted its water supply and the men were about to die, another ship would come in view and they would, they would shout to this ship, do you have any water for us? We are dying of thirst. And they would say, put down your buckets you are in the mouth of the mighty Amazon and there's fresh water right where you are. Well, <clears throat> many Christians like this example live a spiritually deprived life when there are abundant resources. But they don't know how to access those resources. They don't understand those resources. They don't even know those resources exist. Someone has said, what we don't know, we can't understand. What we don't understand, we can't believe. What we don't believe, we can't receive. And what we don't receive, see, we can't possess. It all starts with knowledge. And it's interesting to me how much emphasis is placed on knowledge, especially in the book of Ephesians, and you can turn there because that's where we're going tonight. <clears throat> Our level of experience is based on the knowledge we have to put to practice. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Do you hear that? Uh, the divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So it's all based on knowledge. Now, I always hate to say what I'm going to say next in the presence of someone who knows Greek, because I don't. Uh, so, Finney, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But this word knowledge here, of course, the word for knowledge in the Greek is gnosos. And this word, I think, is, ep in fact, I know it is because I checked it. It's epignosis. Am I right, Brother Finney, that when you put epi in front of a word, it's the intensified form of that word? So this is talking about super knowledge. The strongest possible knowledge that you could have. The most powerful knowledge you could possibly have. And God has given us 
the ability to have access to that knowledge. <clears throat> and Paul is praying in verse 17, if we jump over, we'll get to this later in the ch chapter. He's praying that they would have knowledge uh, <clears throat> because we can, only, uh, we can only live by applying the knowledge we have. And many people do not understand what we're gonna talk about tonight uh, and plus many other things. Now, <clears throat> what we wanna deal with tonight is a misconception that most of you probably have heard, you've listened to some of my messages, and I actually spoke a little bit about this the other day. And that is, there is a tremendous misconception in Christian, Christianity, a misconception of the gospel, that the whole gospel is focused primarily on getting people to heaven when they die. Now, it's interesting to me, here we have the book of Ephesians, and there's not one word about that in the entire book. In fact, there's probably very little about it in any of the epistles. These are all about how we can express heaven on earth, how we can build up the kingdom of God, which Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven. But the epistles then use the word church, and to me, they're both equated. And of course, there's a big debate. Is the kingdom of heaven now or later? I think it's, to me, it's conclusively resolved by the verse in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, where Jesus said, there are people standing here who will not see death till they see the kingdom of heaven come in power. That has to be Pentecost. That has to be now. That has to be our day. <clears throat> so, uh, a lot of people have this idea that it's all about getting to heaven. And if that's what you believe, you lack the knowledge you need to live life to its fullest. Because that's not really God's primary purpose. That's the end game. But what about everything in between? N.T. Wright says the problem with most Christianity it is an empty cloak. It talks about the birth of Christ. It talks about the death and resurrection of Christ. And here we have many chapters in between in the Gospels that they say nothing about. But John chapter 17 has an interesting phrase in it. It says, Jesus prays to the Father and he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Oh, I thought his finished work was the work on the cross. And it was. But it was the second finished work. And so when people say to me, what is the do you believe in the finished work of Christ? I asked them, which one are you talking about? He said there was a finished work before he went to the cross. And then there was a finished work there for sure. He said it is finished. Well, what was the finished work he was talking about? He was talking about all those things that he did, all those things that he said about life here and now before the end. And he says to the Father, I have finished showing these people what life on this earth is supposed to look like. I have finished giving them commandments. I have finished giving them everything they need to live the life and build up this church that I referred to but never completely described. I've given them everything they need to make that to a reality in their lives. And so God's purpose is not for the here and now. To just, you know, when I was a boy growing up, if somebody would have said, what's the, what's the role of the church? I would have said, well, to get us ready to go to heaven. <laughs> And so when people ask me on the telephone, calling from the billboards, what's the difference between what you believe and what most people believe? I say, well, most people believe that it's all about getting to heaven when you die. I believe, and we believe, I hope we believe, and if we don't, I hope by the time uh, this evening is over, I can convince you that it's about getting heaven to earth while we live. <laughs> all right. And then, if, and I tell people on the phone, if, if you enter into that uh, experience, you definitely will go to heaven when you die. In fact, I have my doubts if people are going to go to heaven when they die, if they don't join the kingdom of heaven here and now. Uh, I'm sure there, you know, there are circumstances where people have no opportunity to be part of a corporate body. God understands that, certainly. But especially if a person has an opportunity to express the kingdom of God. With, by the way, a kingdom is a society. It's not one person. These people who think they can be a Christian by themselves, it's like saying, I'm going to play baseball, but I'm not going to join a team. I'm going to play professional baseball, but I don't plan to join any team. Well, that's not the way it is. And that's not how Christianity is either. Jesus said, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And Charles Finney, in his wonderful book, Lectures to Professing Christians, says that any person who, whose primary reason for being a Christian is to escape hell shall surely go there. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, and I'm not sure I'm ready to go out and shout that on, on the streets. But uh, he had a good point. Primary purpose. I mean, obviously, it's in the back of our mind what's going to happen at the end. I mean, I'm not saying that should not be in our thinking at all. But he said any person who's primary, the only reason they're a Christian is to escape hell. He said they'll go there because Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, which is a selfish individualistic motive, 
you will lose it. That's not sufficient to see you through. Here you are in all the pressures of life here and now, and you're trying to make those decisions with a goal that's way out there in the future. Humans don't relate very well to that kind of uh, motivation. They, they need some immediate inspiration, immediate motivation to keep them uh, alive and moving. <clears throat> so, so what is the truth? Well, the truth is in this chapter, and this is one of my favorite chapters. I love to preach on this chapter. The truth is God wants to put his glory on display. Three times in this chapter, it says, to the praise of his glory, Amen. to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. What's he talking about? What is glory? Glory is a manifestation of excellence. When you say that was a glorious sunset, you mean that sunset couldn't have anything added to it. It is a perfect expression of what a sunset should be. It's the glory of youth. What's that mean? It means here's a young man who's everything a young man is supposed to be. You couldn't think of anything you could add. He's just a perfect specimen of uh, youth. Glory is manifestation of excellence. And that's what this is all about. To put God's excellence on display. <clears throat> uh, the lighting here is a little boring. Okay. Uh, the, I want you to turn to Ephesians. You're in Ephesians. Turn to chapter 3. Verse 20. Here's a verse that's many, many times quoted out of context. It's a wonderful verse. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in. Notice, us, not me, us. And then you go to the next verse. It says, unto him be glory. Where's this glory going to be seen? In the church. Amen. By Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So don't take that verse out of context. If you want to see the exceeding greatness of, of uh, his power and all that's in that verse 20, you're going to see that in the church. That's what he's talking about. In fact, that's what this whole book is talking about. It's talking about a corporate expression of God's glory. Somebody has said it this way. In the classroom of God's universe, he is the teacher. The angels are the students. Chapter 3 talks about the principalities and powers watching this whole thing. The angels are the students. We are the illustration. And the subject is the manifold wisdom and glory of God. <laughs> so God is putting it on display. We are the illustration. The angels are watching. They never experienced the uh, sin and the fall and the need to be redeemed. They don't know anything about this except what they see in this great display of God's glory. Taking people who were wretchedly lost and messed up, distorted, and, and uh, just a, 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 a horrible picture of humanity and taking that and perfecting it into something that looked like Jesus. I mean, that is just, the angels are looking on and they're saying, how in the world could that be? How could God do that with such awful people? God wants his excellent character on display to contradict the lie of Satan that God is withholding good from the human race. That's what Satan told Eve. He said, God knows that if you do what he told you not to do, you're going to benefit. And he's trying to keep you from that benefit. Society believes this lie. The people out here actually believe that God is a mean-spirited, grumpy spoiler of men's pleasure. They believe his laws are unreasonable. They believe his demands are impossible. They believe his commandments are unattainable. And even some Christians believe you can't live the Sermon on the Mount. That's some people's concept of God. And we're here to dispel that false concept of God. He's entirely the opposite. All right? The heathen believe this lie. I was in India some years ago, and here Finney can correct me, but they told me that India has a million and a half gods, and they're still counting. And all of those gods are angry. And what you do is you do whatever you possibly can to appease those gods so they don't cause you any trouble. I asked a missionary to India one time what his message to India was, and he said, well, the first thing we tell them is there's only one god, and they said, wow, that's a relief. <laughs> to reduce it from a million and a half to one. And then he says, the next thing we say, and he's a good god. Amen. He's not an angry God. He just would love to pour out benefits. He wants you to be joyful. He says, come before his presence with singing. Make, joyful no make a joyful noise unto the Lord of all ye lands. That's unique to this God. Paul never believed this lie. He insists that God has lavished all of heaven on us so that we can be holy. And that word holy has the idea of whole, completely healed and whole. 
everything that we're supposed to be, fully satisfied, gorged, as I told you yesterday, enjoying what we were made to be. That's what Paul believed. And he got so excited about that that he wrote the longest sentence in the Bible. Verses 3 to 10 is one long sentence. It's 171 words. I tell people, if you're studying Rod and Steph English, this should be the final test to diagram this sentence of Paul's. <laughs> Paul couldn't get stopped. He was so excited about God that this eulogy, he could hardly bring it to an end. All right? And so let's look at that eulogy just a little bit. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. This is not something that's only going to be in the future. Hath is present tense, I think. Hath blessed us already now with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And I like to picture it this way, and I had to put this little easel here so I could knock it down. Dramatic <laughs> effect. <laughs> I don't try to specialize in drama, but it happens. <laughs> of course, you all have heard the phrase, the little acronym for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's, that's a wonderful statement, although I'm still asking, what are the riches? What are the riches? Well, this tells us that God has blessed us with everything that he has in the heavenly realm. They're in the heavenly realm. Here's one. Oh, thank you. They're in the heavenly realm is, God, all, is God's wisdom, of course, which is unlimited. God's strength, which is unlimited. God's forgiveness, which is unlimited. God, I mean, you just fill in the blanks. Unlimited everything is there in that heavenly realm with God. And Paul says, although the word grace is not in this verse, he says, God has blessed us with everything that is there. Mm -hmm. Through Christ, we experience little people like us. Amen. Everything that heaven has. Yeah. God has literally lavished everything in heaven. He has nothing more to give us. He's opened up every, everything that he has. So you have to make a decision. James says, he gives it liberally. God opens up all that he has, but we have to understand how to respond to God because God isn't going to support something with his grace that he disapproves of. <laughs> so if you make a decision that God can't support, you won't get any of this. He's not going to support something that you do that displeases him. But if he sees you responding the way he wants you to respond. And that's the knowledge we need to have. We need to understand how not to frustrate the grace of God. How to respond in our actions, our thoughts, our words, in a way that God says, Amen. Let's just pour all of heaven into that. We want that to succeed. We want him to be able to do that. That man that wronged him and he just can't find it in his heart to forgive, he's decided to, to demonstrate, by the way, God never says you're supposed to have fuzzy feelings toward anything. When he says love your enemies, he says do good, bless them, pray for There's things you do. And when he sees us doing those things, he, he's, all of heaven is behind us. And he makes it a success. I just get so excited about this. Amen. He's lavished on us. Far from what the heathen thinks that God is a stingy God that doesn't really want to have, have us uh, succeed. It's the exact opposite. He's placed all of the resources that heaven has behind us as we respond the way he wants us to respond. This, this passage talks about the glory of his grace. It talks about the riches of his grace. It's all about, it's a celebration of God and his grace and his goodness. So we have at our disposal supernatural wisdom, supernatural power, supernatural love, supernatural peace, Supernatural forgiveness, supernatural long suffering, supernatural patience, supernatural mercy, and we could go on for a long time. It's all at our disposal. I give the story of Corey Ten Boom, who explained in a very practical way how this works. She said she one time was giving a message in Germany. Now, she had been in Belsen Bergen, Bergen uh, concentration camp, and there was a guard there, a guard that went out of his way to dehumanize her in every way you could think of. And so after she left Germany, she went back for some ministry 
And one night after she spoke, she saw him, that man, coming down the aisle, holding out his hand, saying, Corey, will you forgive me? And she said, even as a Christian, I had no love and no forgiveness for this man. My heart was a piece of ice. But I knew that Jesus said that you are to do love. And she said, I had no control over my feelings, which, by the way, you don't have much control over your feelings. But she said, I knew I did have control over this hand. And he was reaching out his hand. So she said, I took my hand to reach out. And she said, when I made that decision, it was as if electricity went down through my arm and into my hand. And when I clasped his hand, the love of Christ filled my heart. See, God saw her making the right decision. And he did his part. And she said, when I grasped his hand, I can honestly say, brother, I forgive you. And I love you. That's how the grace of God works. That's what we're talking about tonight. And you see, if you're not well acquainted with how God thinks and how he wills and, his, and Jesus' example and Jesus' teachings and all the things we should be learning about what God wants and how he thinks and feels and wills, we're not going to respond that way. All right? And, but when we do, the message tonight is all of this is behind us. In fact, I tell my charismatic friends who always want to see miracles, I said, if you really want to see miracles, live the Sermon on the Mount. Right. Amen. Everything that Jesus says there is impossible. It's impossible for a person to stay in a, a difficult marriage that's just miserable day after day after day. That's impossible, except for God's grace. It's impossible not to find some way to get back at your enemy, even if it is just calling someone on the phone and gossiping about him. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to live without accumulating wealth. I mean, that's the most stupid thing you can think of from a human standpoint. All of these things are impossible. And, but they're all possible if we respond in a way that all of this comes to, our, uh, to be our resources. Philippians 4.19 says, God shall supply all your need according to, not, not out of his riches, but according to his riches. And there's a difference. If it be out of his riches, it would be he would be giving you some of the things you need. But according to his riches would be what you would get from him would be... Uh, uh, an indication of how rich he is. <laughs> In other words, if you had a $100,000 hospital bill and I gave you $75,000, that would be out, of, and I was a multimillionaire or even a billionaire, that would be out of my riches. You'd be very happy that I did that. But if I paid your whole hospital bill and then gave you another $100,000 to do whatever you wanted to do, that, now that gives you some idea how rich I am. That's commensurate with my riches. And, and Philippians says, God is... God, God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And then, of course, there's my favorite verse of the whole Bible, I think, but especially the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It says, God is able to make all grace abound. That's unlimited. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound, unlimited, unto every good work. Amen. I've said already that if I said that, if I would have said that, people would have said, well, John has an overactive imagination. That is a ridiculous, exaggerated statement. It can't be that good. But this is God. Amen. God said, I'm able to make all grace, everything that's there, abound towards you, unlimited outpouring of it, that you, and the reason for it, is because I want you always to have all the sufficiency you need so that you can abound unto every good work. So that's what, this, that's what this is all about. God wants to put what I've just been describing to you on display so the world understands his true character and understands the, the blessedness of his people and the beauty of the character that they express. Now this little passage, Ephesians chapter 1, is a hymn with three stanzas. God chose, Christ redeemed, the Holy Spirit sealed, and after every description there, it has to the praise of the glory of his grace. It's not those exact words, but that's the essence of it. That God chose to put his glory on display, Christ redeemed to put his glory on display, the Holy Spirit seals to put his glory on display, and that's what this song is all about. So let's talk about Christ cho God choosing. This is a big subject, and the word predestinated is in here. What's this all about? Well, it says he chose us so that we would be holy 
and without blame. He's not saying he chose us to get us to heaven when we die. <laughs> That's not what this predestination was all about. That's not what this choosing was all about. Peter says, ye are a chosen generation. That, there, there you have your hint of election. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now we're talking about the kingdom of God a peculiar favored people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I have never heard anybody say this, so you theologians, please correct me after this meeting, but I think the choosing is because God is making up a very special society and he is electing or choosing people to be part of that society. He's not choosing people primarily to go to heaven, he's choosing people to express heaven on earth, this holy nation. And how does he do the choosing? Well, you notice it says he chose us in Christ. So in other words, every person who is in Christ becomes part of this special nation. Does that make sense? And every person has the privilege to do that. I'll prove it to you. Turn to John chapter six. John chapter six says this. Verse 44, no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all, underline that word all, they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and Jesus was constantly pleading people to open their ears and hear. He obviously believed every person could do that. Those who have heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh to me. And they surrender to Christ, they're born again, and they're in Christ. And then they're chosen to be part of an elect nation. That's how I understand predestination. God has always wanted a people. In the Old Testament, he wanted a people who demonstrated what a nation looked like, whose God is the Lord. Now he wants a corporate expression of what society was supposed to look like before man fell. That's how I picture it. Because Jesus said at one point that you people divorce and remarry, but it was not so from the beginning. That's my hint that God wants to take us back to the original ideals for man. He wants to put on display, finally, what a society would look like if sin had not affected it. Now, they won't be perfect because we still struggle with sin and we fail, but these people will repent. They will constantly pursue this ideal and there will be a credible picture, at least glimmerings, of what that ideal society could look like. And, and the world should be able to look in and say, hey, I would love to be part of that. I know down deep in my heart that's what man should be. Here it is. I see these people doing it. Look at their families. Look at their children. Look at how they treat each other. Look how they relate to their enemies. Look how they forgive. Look how they do all the things that I know down deep in heart, we, my heart, heart I should do, but I never can find the power to do it and I live in a world where nobody does it. That's what God wants the world to see. Amen. And he's chosen us to be this holy nation. All right? Many are preoccupied with this whole thing. How does God choose? Well, he goes, eeny, meeny, my. I think they've missed the whole point. The point is that he's choosing a elect people and it's all going to be in Christ. Did you ever notice all the prepositional phrases in the epistles? There are 34 of them in, I think, uh, Ephesians. And I don't know how many there are, about 17 of them in this chapter. In Christ, to Christ, unto Christ, for Christ, through Christ. Amen. Everything is predicated on whether or not you are in Christ. <laughs> and if you're in Christ, you're part of this very, very elect group of people. All right. This nation is made up of children who have been adopted. Notice he has adopted us. All right. That's amazing to me. God could have looked at all of us and could have said, those people are in a bad way. They're headed for perdition. We're going to do something for them. We're going to save them from that awful uh, sentence that's on them. And we're going to make them servants in our kingdom. We're going to make them slaves. We're going to make them second class citizens. But that's not what God did. He said, we're going to redeem them and we're going to make them part of the family. And John was so amazed with this that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he says, behold, what manner of love. I think that word, Finney, is strange. What strange love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Amen. Come on. Why would God want a bunch of us to be part of his family? 
I haven't been a very good representation of my father, but yet he wants me to be part of his family. And uh, that's what he wants. It says we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We, God didn't redeem us and then make us slaves and live in fear, that kind of uh, serv serv servile fear of him. He's called us sons. We're in his family. We're going to share the inheritance with his son. It's just unbelievable. All right. The choosing was accomplished in Christ. And I already gave you this prepositional phrase. It's a little bit like anybody who was born in Abraham's family was heir to everything that Abraham had been promised. And if you're in Christ, you're heir to everything that has been promised to Jesus. All right. And we were chosen for what reason? To be holy and without blame. Now I want you to notice how this should read. The punctuation was not in the original. It was put in by the translators and it resulted in a certain amount of interpretation. I want you to look at verses, starting with verse four. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then it has the punctuation. I don't think that's right. I think the comma should be after him. And I think it should read this way. According as he has chosen us in, in him, notice how he's chosen us, in him, every person that's in him is one of the elect, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And there we get to God's motive. Why did he do it? Simply because... He's a God of love. He's a God of love. It delighted him. It gives him pleasure. It's a chance for him to express his love, to do this for us. No reason in us. This is a mystery to me. I'm like John. Behold what strange love this is. This is a love I can't understand. That he would want me to be family. Not just a servant, not just a second class citizen in his kingdom, but a, a son that actually has his divine nature. He gives that to us too. <laughs> this is just incredible when you stop to think about it, what God has accomplished in this choosing. For the praise of the glory of his grace. He does it all because those principalities are watching and God wants them to see his glory on display. And he also wants the world to see it too. We're supposed to demonstrate what the whole world would look like if everybody obeyed Jesus. That's right. Not perfectly, but credibly, what that would look like. So that's God choosing for the praise of the glory of his grace. Then it says Christ redeemed us. And notice we're redeemed in him. I'm not sure it'd be that much different if it say by him, but I, that's interesting to me that we're redeemed as we are in Christ, the redemption is experienced. And then there are four things that happen in this redemption. The first thing he mentions is the forgiveness of sins through his blood. This is unique among religions. People often ask me, why is Christianity touted as the only true religion? And I say to them, Jesus Christ is the only person who ever came to this world to take away sin. Right, amen. All the other religions I know of, and if you know of any exceptions to this, you come and talk to me afterward, have a lawgiver. Many of them give wonderful laws and rules to live by but they do nothing about the sins that have already been committed, and they do nothing to give you what you need to keep that record clean. Right. Right. This is unique to the gospel. In fact, we sing it in Rock of Ages. We're gonna sing the first verse of Rock of Ages, and I want you to listen. We're gonna talk about a double cure, and I want you to listen carefully because after we sing double cure, it tells you what the double cure is. Rock of Ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wound and side which flow, listen carefully, be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power the double cure to cleanse from the guilt that's already been accrued and to keep that record clean. It's tremendous. This is tremendous. This is unique. Redemption means we were brought back. 
We were bought back and given a new beginning to start all over again. And that's unique to the gospel. That's part of this, uh, to the praise of his glory, that he can do that with the sins that we have committed. The second thing he says is he's abounded toward us, abounded, notice, in all wisdom and prudence. Well, what is wisdom? Well, here's my homemade definition. Wisdom is what you would do if you knew all the facts related to that decision. So that tomorrow you would have no regrets. The next day you would have no regrets. The next week you would have no regrets. A year from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, and even in eternity, if you look back, you'd have no regrets about the decision and the action. That's wisdom. The problem is we don't have that, that view, but God does. And if we obey him, we can make good marriages. We can raise good families. We can do all the things that most people look back with regrets on. See, the opposite of wisdom is to do something today and tomorrow, oh my, I wish I hadn't done it. 10 years from now, oh my, I just had this to do over again. A hundred years. In fact, to me, this is the definition of eternal life. It's to live today with the eternal perspective. So that no matter how far in the future you reflect on what you did today, it was in an eternal perspective. It was eternally the right thing to do. And he says he's abounded toward us in all of that. And so I'm asking myself, why do people make such disastrous decisions? Why do churches go down such dark roads? Why do such strange things happen among God's people that they have to live in all kinds of regret because of what they did? Now we are imperfect and we will make some mistakes, but I don't think we need to make mistakes in the major decisions of life because God has clearly told us how to make those decisions. And he has abounded toward us in all wisdom, and he says he'll give it liberally if we ask. There will be no lack of wisdom to the person who is in Christ, who is, uh, is gaining knowledge about what that's all about. And then he says he's abounded toward us in prudence. If you look the word prudence up in the dictionary, it literally means to carry out the wisdom. So you not only have the ability to decide what is right from an eternal perspective, you're given the ability to carry that out, no matter how difficult it may be. I often use the example of one day I was uh, asked to dig thistles down in the, uh, the uh, pasture below our farm. And it was a really hot day and I got really thirsty. And our milk house, our, our milking parlor was a long distance from the house. The barn was between the, milk, the house and the milking parlor. And I didn't want to walk the whole way up to the house to get a drink. So I thought I'll just go in the milk house and get a drink. And while I was drawing the water, I looked over at the uh, pipes going into the milk tank and they had a coating of ice on them. And I thought, well, that would really be refreshing to take a lick of that ice. But I was finally cemented to that pipe with my tongue. And I tried to yell, but there wasn't anybody to hear me. And I couldn't get my tongue loose. And I finally tore a piece of it out. You know what? I tell everybody not to do that. <laughs> And I don't do it. <laughs> I've never done that again. <laughs> See, wisdom would have, been, would have been to know what would happen if I did that. And so they say you, uh, uh, the school of experience is a good experience. The only problem with it, the colors are black and blue. You can learn a lot, but the colors aren't very good. All right. So he has abounded toward us in wisdom and prudence. There's no need to make bad decisions. At least the major decisions of life we should be able to make well because he has abounded toward us in wisdom and prudence. Okay? And then he reveals to us the mystery of his will. Verse 10 is the theme verse of the entire book. It says this, that in the ages, to, um, sorry, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are in earth. God intends finally to reconcile everything, and he's working on it now, but it will finally all be reconciled to Christ. The Bible says, in Christ, all things consist. Now here again, Finney, you're going to have to help me if I'm wrong. But I think the word there is cohere, holds together. All right? And when I think of that, I think of the atom, which I know now that it's not the smallest uh, uh, part of matter but we used to at least think that, and it is one of the small, everything's made of atoms. And in the middle of that atom are protons, and they, are, they have a positive charge. Now you science students, what happens if you have two things together that are of a positive charge? They fly apart. What holds those protons together? 
I asked my good friend Lester Showalter, the scientist that I know, and he says they don't know. They literally do not know. They think there must be some kind of invisible bands. Well, you call that science fiction? Okay? It's a good idea. I will tell you something about it. That bond is so strong, despite those positive charges, that bond is so strong that it takes huge atom smashers to break that bond. I mean, that's a bond that is almost impossible to break. What is holding that together? They don't know. I do. Christ. And when he releases his grasp, what we have described will literally take place. This whole universe, or the earth at least, will disintegrate in a ball of fire. Now that's the kind of bond that Christ wants in marriages. That's the kind of bond Christ wants in churches. That's the kind of bond Christ wants between parents and children. That's the kind of bond Christ wants between employers and employees. God wants coherence. He wants to hold things together and reconcile. In fact, this whole book is about it. Reconciling parents to children, Jews to Gentiles, employers to employees, parents to children, wives to husbands. It's all about this cohering power of God. And when somebody comes to me and says, we can't live together any longer because we're incompatible, I have a tendency to say, well, dummy, that's what it's all about. God's ability to reconcile the irreconcilable. <laughs> That's the miracle, that God can reconcile the irreconcilable. So don't say, I can't get along with that, brother. Don't say, we can't reconcile this problem in our church. Don't say, we can't reconcile our marriage. That's what the gospel's all about. All of the resources of heaven giving you the ability to reconcile the irreconcilable. Amen. This is tremendous. You can tell I get excited about it. In him, all things cohere. In Christ. And then finally, we have an inheritance. We are joint heirs with Christ. It says he hath made us joint heirs in Christ. It means now. And of course, later, everything. Okay? This is a true rags to riches promise. That we should be to the praise of the glory of his grace. Are you putting God's grace on display by the things I'm just describing to you? That's the question. But the glory is displayed only... And here's the secret. The glory is displayed by the obedience that gives him the understanding that he can support what we're doing and what we're saying with all of heaven behind us. And then he seals us with the Holy Spirit. Now what does the Holy Spirit seal? Well, he seals the whole experience. I want you to notice the whole experience is described in verse 13. And if you want to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have, to, you have to have this whole experience before he seals. Look what it says. It says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Ghost. So what he's saying is that we are sealed after we hear the word of truth, we believe it, we trust in it, which means we act on it, and yes, we hear it, we believe it, and we trust, and then that's sealed. Okay? It's a total surrender to Christ based on our belief and understanding of what he has promised to us. I tell the story of Charles Blunden. Charles Blunden put a rope across the, the rapids of the Niagara River, not across the falls, but across the rapids in the middle of the 1800s, and he walked back and forth on that rope every day. And he was undeniably the most skilled tightrope walker probably that the world has ever seen. And so crowds of people gathered there in the, at the Niagara River to watch this day after day after day. At one point, he took a hot plate out in the middle of the rope and built a fire and fried an egg and ate it. Uh, that tells you the strength of his stomach. I certainly wouldn't have been able to do that. But anyway, he also had a wheelbarrow with a groove wheel on it and he would take loads across on that rope. And there came a day when he said, does anybody believe I can take a human being across in this wheelbarrow? And their hands all went up. They all believed that he could. And then he asked the inevitable question. Do I have a volunteer? <laughs> and no hands went up. Now my question is, did they believe him? 
I think they did academically, but they did not trust. They did not trust. He finally wrestled his manager into the wheelbarrow and wheeled a very nervous man across the, the rapids of the Niagara Falls. But many people are like those people that put up their hands. I believe in Jesus, but they don't trust. They won't get in the wheelbarrow. And he says the person who gets in the wheelbarrow, God seals them with the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, what is that seal? See, I was a young boy with problems with assurance of salvation, and I would ask the best theologians I knew, and I could name them, that came down the road. If they got within 50 miles of where I lived, I went to visit them to ask them how I, because I had understood that if I could prove I had the Holy Spirit, then I could say for sure I was a Christian. And they would say the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, well, you don't understand. When you're having the problem I'm having, you have no peace, you have no joy, you don't have any of those things. In fact, if it's the fruit of the Spirit that's to be the proof that I have the Holy Spirit, then I have the proof I don't have the Holy Spirit. This was a real dilemma. And then I happened on Romans 8, verse 14. As many as are led, and here again, Finney, I wish you could comment. I think that's a strong word that could be translated driven. As many as are driven by the Holy Spirit have a passionate drive toward Jesus, have a passionate drive away from the world, have a passionate drive to be like Christ, have a passionate drive to build up his kingdom. They have a passion for everything God has a passion for. If you would sense that passion within you, that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And I had that. And when I saw that, I literally jumped up and down and shouted for joy because that is the seal of the Holy Spirit. And I see so many people who claim to have the Holy Spirit that seem to have no spiritual drive, no spiritual passion. They drift in the opposite direction and they claim to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the passion, is the drive. The whole, by the way, the word spirit is, has the whole concept of motivation. So, as many as are driven by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. And he seals us with that seal because he wants the praise of the glory that's revealed in that pursuit. <clears throat> well, I'm just going to read the last, the last verses. I don't know how much time I've been here, but I'm sure it's been long enough. I want to read just the last verses and I'll comment as we go. Verse 15. Wherefore, because of all this that you just heard, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. By the way, the whole Christian life is described right there. Right. <laughs> there it is. Uh, faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. He says, I cease not to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, what's he making mention of? He's making mention of this knowledge that he knows they need to have. He's begging God, he's praying God to give them what he's just going to describe here. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This is what he's praying for. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now we're not talking about our inheritance, we're talking about his inheritance. His inheritance is you. Here is potential. Somebody who buys a property goes on to that property and says, well, I can do this with this and I can do this. He, he, talks, he tries to visualize the potential of that property and he's not satisfied until he's brought that property to that potential. And we are his inheritance and nobody ever looked at an inheritance more jealously than God does. In fact, our late Bishop Lynn Martin used to say, this church, in all churches, but this church is the apple of God's eye. There is nothing in this world that he's more jealous about than what's sitting right here tonight. He would love to see the full potential of this group. That's what he wants to see. It's his inheritance. And Paul is saying, I hope you get your eyes open and see that you are the inheritance of God. And he has potential in mind and he wants to give you what it takes to realize all of that potential, okay? And what the exceeding greatness of his power is to us who, us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, and now he has a description of that power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. So he's just described that that. This power that Jesus demonstrated exceeds any other concept of power. 
And he's put all things under his feet for what reason? Gave him to be the head over all that to the church. And what's the church? It's the fullness of the person who fills everything. And these people that say, I don't need the church. Yes, you can experience Christ and you can experience the Holy Spirit and all of that individually. But if you want the full experience of the Godhead, if you want the full experience of God, it's in the gathered body. It's not in you personally and individually. And I remember I was in a Bible school one time sitting in a rather boring class and I sat, opened my Bible and turned to this passage. And it, what I just told you finally hit me. What the church really is, what God wants to do and where his presence, his full presence dwells. And I was so excited, I practically levitated up off my seat. I got so excited, and I want to tell you, I'm like Gypsy Smith. Somebody asked him when he was in his 80s and he was still preaching, powerful messages. Fleming Revell, which was his publisher, said, Gypsy, what is the secret to your ministry? I have never lost the wonder. I have never lost the wonder. I still have a passion to see that realized. And I still have a passion to have you understand it and have you help to realize it. This is tremendous potential. All the potential that God wants to realize is in his church, is in his kingdom of heaven on this earth. And these people who are just living, you know, to get to heaven when they die, just appropriate enough whatever to do enough things that they can get. They're like the people sitting at the mouth of the Amazon River living unfulfilled lives, frustrated, making stupid decisions, experiencing the consequences of their small knowledge when they could be having buckets full of the grace of God. I conclude with this story. Heinrich Schliemann, at the age of seven, was intrigued by a picture that he saw in a book from his father's bookshelf. It was a picture of the burning of Troy. So he went to his parents, this little seven-year-old boy, and said, what is this picture about? And his dad said, well, that's a picture about the burning of Troy. There was no such city. Homer was a blind poet. He wrote this I Iliad and Odyssey, and it's all imaginary. Uh, and that's a picture of an imaginary city burning. I don't know why, but this little boy somehow didn't believe that. So he went on to study to be an archaeologist. And in 1873, he took a team of archaeologists to what is present-day Turkey, and he, lo and behold, discovered the city of Troy. He unearthed it, he took its treasures, he became rich, he became famous, because he dared to believe an ancient record. I challenge you tonight, do you dare to believe what I told you? Do you dare to put it to practice? Do, do, do you dare to, to exercise a passionate obedience to all God wants to show you so that he can open all the resources of heaven and then bless not only you, but the congregation where you fellowship? Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you tonight. Take away all our excuses. Oh God, we are so quick to say what we can or can't do. But when you say it, all of heaven is behind the door of it. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help this followers of the way group here in Boston to be able to demonstrate that beautiful kingdom of heaven so credibly that many people will say, I want to go there. I want to be part of that. What I see will fulfill my deepest longings. Bless us, Father, not just here in Boston, but everywhere, all over this world. May we get serious about demonstrating your kingdom and forget about ourselves and our selfish desire to get saved and go to heaven, but get passionate about bringing heaven to earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. It's been a wonderful weekend. I've looked forward to this for a long time and I have not been disappointed. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Wow. What incredible promises that we have in Christ Jesus. I just wanted to open it up maybe a little bit. Anyone has a question or a uh, testimony, something they'd want to share, God put on your heart? Ask Brother John D. Or... Uh, 
I, I was, I, I've been constantly amazed by this Ephesians passage. And it is the kind of a passage that it's like, come on, Paul, not really. It can't be that good. When you take the words that he's talking about this and this kind of almost um, just this, this flowing and, and gushy praise of, of all this power. When you can talk about the power of the universe, the power of God and, and all those things being put into an individual to experience on this life to give glory back to God, how can it be? It is such an incredible blessing. And I, and I loved your, your, your story there. Do we dare to, to believe the ancient record? Do we dare to believe and put this into some sort of application in our life? And I know that all of us have different types of uh, things that we may be experiencing, different sins in our life that we're dealing with, different weights that are taking us down. I wonder if we would dare to believe the truths of what we're reading in Ephesians chapter 1 here, what difference it would make today. Are you convincing yourself, that's great language, but that language is not for me. Is it, are, you, are you daring to accept it and, and, and gather it? I encourage us just to, to grab a hold of that with, with all of our heart. So, yes, brother. Yeah, thanks for the message. Amen. That's an incredible thought. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, Mike. I don't want to read, say anything, but this is all like very, very present in my life right now. Um, I wanted to just share one thing. Um, as I heard that your, your challenge at the end, uh, Keith Daniel shared a story. Uh, some of you are familiar with Keith Daniel. Um, he was impressed. He was with his wife one day. He was impressed to run across the street to this house and pound on the door. He didn't know why, so he was praying, Lord, I don't want to do that. Uh, he eventually gave up and did it. He got out of the car and ran across the street and ran up to this house, up to the steps, started pounding on the door, like, I don't know who's in there, but but God wants me to, to tell you something. And he pounded on the door, and it was a number of minutes, and finally somebody was there, and he was going inside, and the lady barely opened the door. And he said, I don't know who you are, but God loves you, and the Lord Jesus Christ wants to be your Lord. And, and he just kind of discussed few words came out. He didn't know what he was supposed to do. And she opened the door, and she was weeping, and she had a noose around her neck. She was getting ready to kill herself. Hmm. And the Lord impressed his brother to go wow. and just say something. And as he was sharing this testimony, somebody told him, Brother Keith, I, I want God to use me that way. And then Keith Daniel said this, he says, you will, if you let him. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. reflecting on that right now, and I, I want to do that. Mm. Wow. I'm excited about that. Amen. Wow, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? The testimony. 
Well, amen. Well, let's let's all. I'm going to close us with Psalm. I mean, with uh, Song 417. Turn to that. And I and I we thank you very much, Brother John D, being here the whole weekend, um, speaking in many of our churches, speaking at the school, speaking in different houses, and it's been a very uh, Patricia. We appreciate you coming also and your testimony and and all of your your testimony of faith. I think the, my mind went to, four, the, to song 417 because Charles Wesley, as you know, I've told the story before, John and Charles left America as failures in their 30s, at least John was in his 30s, and a complete failure, and Charles felt like his whole life he was depressed, he was just laying around and, and couldn't have confidence until actually a young lady quoted a scripture over him, rise and have faith. He speaks of... <clears throat> This idea of him believing that Jesus Christ could save him, and he rose. And shortly after, this is one of the earlier songs that, that he wrote, and it talks about this. And I don't, I don't know whatever we're going through tonight, this is truth. As much as those protons are holding him, a, a, each other together, which is just so big that we can't hardly wrap our minds around it and so powerful. And it starts off with this song, and is it even possible that I could have an interest? And you know, that's, this is interest like if you had interest in a stock or a bond or, or a business or something. Could it be possible that I have interest in Google when it was, you know, first built or whatever, or Apple or whatever? Is it possible that I could have interest in the Savior's blood? And the power of this, this is the kind of thing that we're hearing that John D. preaching on tonight, and all this power, all these things, it is possible. This is amazing love, and how could it possibly be? Let's stand at our feet, and we'll close with this song. And sing to the Lord with all of our heart. And let's believe it. This is, this is incredible truth. Little, Raven, Little Ravenhill says, we lie most when we're singing. <laughs> um, and so let's let this be completely true and that we hold on to these promises just like we've heard about them tonight. Mm. Let's sing. And can it be that I should gain and in trust in the Savior's blood died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued amazing love how
my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nay. Is this your story? Sing out then. Thine I diffuse a quick ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. Hallelujah. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose when forth and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Last verse, sing to the Lord. No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Alive in Him, a living head, and clothes in righteousness. Divine, sing out. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou die for me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truths of this. And dear God, we pray and, all, and my unbelief heal, O God, dear Lord. I believe, but help my unbelief. Let us truly embrace these incredible things that we've seen. And only by your grace and by your spirit that you can put into our lives can we even come close to it. So Lord, I pray that you would make us all faithful and truly walk this out in the church as we've seen it here presented today. We thank you, Lord, for what we've had. May you receive the glory, the power, the strength. To you is all honor. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.